welcome Dr. Pierre Molian to the Faculty of Pharmacy. Thank you, Dr. Molian, for having allocated your time to visit our school and to enrich and update our knowledge on the innovative medicines initiatives through the conference that will follow. Thank you. In Faculty of Pharmacy, we have been engaged with IMEI from its early conception through several of our members actively contributing to the European Medicines Agency or the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Science. Our contribution has kept up to the presence, namely in Scientific Committee of IMEI2, and we are really very proud of this. As a school who trains health professionals with, uh, while integrating a research institute in medicines and healthcare, the IMED, U Lisboa, holding a strong component in regulatory science, we are in the central position to develop innovative strategies on health science and healthcare, integrating basic and applied research, covering central components from product development to usage. We are well aware on how the mission of pharmacists is evolving in the revolutionary context of healthcare strategy, with more and more our progress around medicines into a much wider and complex context, browned by the explosion of innovative scientific, technological and societal tools made, uh, being made available. The Innovative Medicines Initiative is one hope of uh, all of this innovation, wisely integrating the, multi the multiplicity of its factors and uh, its projects. I'm sure that your conference will be an inspiration to our school and will help us to better understand on how to engage the Innovative Medicines Initiative facing the challenge put by the explosion in science and technology for the sake of an improved and healthier society in Europe and worldwide. Thank you very much and thank you for your conference. Okay, good afternoon. I must start, I'm going to start with a statement in Portuguese because Pierre is not supposed to listen. So, a conferência estava marcada para as seis e meia. Eu tenho que confessar que estivemos no meu gabinete à espera de encher ligeiramente a sala porque vimos que havia um trânsito enorme e às seis e meia praticamente a sala estava vazia, portanto estivemos a... a, a digamos, a compor a sala e por isso uh, termos começado um bocadinho uh, mais tarde, mas foi mesmo com o objetivo de ter uma audiência decente, porque é uma alta responsabilidade, trazer um speaker e depois deste nível e depois não ter suficiente quórum. E portanto, muito obrigada pela vossa presença. Thank you very much, dear friends, dear colleagues, for your presence here at this time, at this late time, in the inaugural conference of our Master on Regulation and Evaluation of Medicines and Health Products, the so-called already famous RAMPS, the master course which is now reach, uh, reaching its eighth edition and which has been running since 2002. Uh, well, I would say why ramps in 2002, it was relatively early. Well, uh, the setting up of this course has been the natural consequence of a, a kind of a roadmap that, uh, the reg for the regulatory affairs in Portugal that was more or less stated even before. And to give you just a little insight on that, we have to go back to the late 80s, uh, more or less up to 1993, at the time when the Portuguese regulatory authority had initiated its new model modern age in Portugal towards the European regulatory system. Um, and uh, under the leadership of uh, Dr. Aranda da Silva and uh, our professor José Moraes, respectively in the management and in the scientific issues, the, Europe, the Portuguese agency in Farmed and its European component has been built under an alliance that Professor Gaspar is saying has been a sacred alliance between the agency and academia science. And I would say at that time it was really innovative, I would dare to say. 
So, <clears throat> bridging with academia has been a strategic decision at that time. It was very successful uh, and it even made possible for Portugal as a member state to reach high levels of scientific performance in the initial phase of the building of the European regulatory system. I remind you that the European Medicines Agency was stated in London in 1995 and uh, yes, it really started a new era and uh, the, the input from the Portuguese uh, at that time was, was quite uh, significant. Many of us uh, here in this faculty and in the Universidad de Lisboa have worked for that endeavor and the small team of European experts at the start was only the front line of a scientific community which started flourishing in Portugal in this area of the regulatory science. <clears throat> The role of ramps in the training of this community is well documented by an interesting number of master students that are working at the, Medi the European Medicines Agency. We have many, uh, even from our earlier students in ramps. Uh, the Portuguese agency, uh, several departments of national and international pharmaceutical companies as well, not to even refer some leadership in several uh, working parties and committees that we had uh, under the Portuguese uh, leadership, and we are still keeping, for example, the leadership of the Committee of Orphan Medicines uh, by Professor Bruno Spoch. In the last decade, deep reflections on the need to improve medicine success associated to the explosion in technology and science, and I can tell you we had today a very good insight on this explosion this uh, afternoon when we were visiting the cancer, uh, re the research institute uh, in Champalimau Center, uh, has been revolutionizing the strategies for medicine development. Academia and users like the patients and the payers are being increasingly requested to become recognized partners in the process. Uh, for the ramps, this meant that the curriculum reformulation had to be performed uh, already. Uh, uh, first as a first step and now updates are being introduced annually as needed because really the changes are being important. From a regulatory affairs master, the ramps naturally progressed into the regulatory science course which we have today. So nowadays I have the benefit and the honor to lead a group where uh, Professor Ana Paula Martins, Rogério Gaspar, Antonio Almeida, Rui Santos Ivo are all embracing this next generation of advanced training purposes. We want to make regulatory science the main enabler for translational research in medicines, towards precision medicine, to establish through ramps a cornerstone to build a better global collaboration and pharmaceutical sciences. And we make it together with several friends and colleagues uh, from abroad with special reference to colleagues like Professor Bert Leufkens, Eric Abadi, Per Spindler, Ole Bierham, Hans Linden, um, Leslie Bennett, among others. In this context of the progress and innovation, the Innovative Medicines Initiative has been, is and will be playing a determinant role on driving what I dare to call a revolution in the medicines development process, which has started, is ongoing at a high speed, and I can anticipate that it will only increase. So having Dr. Pierre Mullian here with us today uh, constitutes a momentum to look into the future and to learn on how the biggest ambition that had been expressed by European Federation of Pharmaceutical Sciences in 2000, uh, when the embryo of IMI started being discussed, which is making better medicines faster and safer, and I would add more accessible to patients, is being accomplished and also how it is being updated in line to the current societal changes and demands. This is a high-speed train, and here at this country, at this university, we need to participate in the journey as active participants, not just travelers. We really need to be there and to contribute. So now I would say it's the time to give the floor to our invited keynote speaker, Dr. Malia, and I would start by introducing you. I have read your CV. I didn't ask, but I did read it. So, <clears throat> um, 
Dr. Pierre Melian is a PhD in molecular biology from the University of by the University of Edinburgh and worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the Institut Pasteur. So I think we have here also some collaborators that and colleagues who have passed also through the same place. Uh, Pierre Melian comes from IMI from Genome Canada comes to IMI, sorry, IMI2, actually, um, from Genome Canada. He brings with him a wealth of experience working in academia, the pharmaceutical industry, and research funding foundations in both sides of the Atlantic. So, somehow I would say he puts together in one person multiple stakeholders that are really key players in uh, the Innovative Medicines Initiative project. He developed the Genomics Innovation Network to keep Canada at edge of genomic-based technologies. Before 2010, he has been Chief uh, Scientific Offer, uh, Officer of the Genome British Columbia. He, has funded, uh, found, he was founding CEO of the Dublin Molecular Medicine Centre, now the Molecular Medicine in Ireland, which linked the three medical schools and six teaching hospitals in Dublin to build a critical mass in molecular medicine and translational research. Therefore, again, very much aligned with all the strategies that are behind the Innovative Medicines Initiative. So, Pierre Melian has also experience on working with industry, having worked with Aventis Pasteur in Canada and France, and at the French biotechnology company Transgene. And last but not least, in 2005, Pierre has been Irish representative in the IMI States Representative Group, which is very interesting. So, what goes around comes around, and therefore, <laughs> So here we have Pierre again, driving uh, the Innovative Medicines Initiative, showing how round and small the world is, but how appropriate has been the choice that has been made uh, to IMI now. So Pierre, once again, thank you so much for coming. We are really happy, and with this audience, I must say, I'm really relaxed now. <laughs> thank you for your presentation. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, uh, Beatrice, for that very kind introduction. Uh, I've already had uh, a fantastic day today, I have to say. Uh, so thank you, uh, Mathilde, on the, on, for the invitation to your faculty. Uh, Rogero, it's very uh, nice to have met you and spent some time with you today as well, and, and others. And I have to say, I have been incredibly impressed uh, with the the Cancer Institute, the Neuroscience Institute that we visited um, uh, during the day. Um, and, um, you know, there's no reason why uh, Portuguese teams uh, should not be very much present in IMI. And uh, so I'm relying on you to, uh, to uh, take the challenge up and, and join uh, others uh, to build uh, great things for, uh, for Portugal. Um, in innovative medicines. So what I'm going to try and do today is to uh, give you some rationale why IMI exists uh, and uh, should, con should continue to exist. Uh, I am relatively new to uh, IMI itself. I've uh, been in post uh, since mid-September. So I'm still learning a lot about uh, about things in, in general and how things work. Uh, but uh, my motivation for being really interested in uh, the job at IMI was really to do with my conviction that the challenges are so complex uh, relating to delivering innovations in healthcare to European citizens and, and citizens of the world that um, a special montage is required to do this. And one of the uh, experiments, and it's quite a big experiment, I, I guess, um, that is really on the world stage currently is the public-private partnership of the Innovative Medicines Initiative. So let me just start then by 
talking to you a little bit about the, the challenges or the drivers for change in uh, innovative medicines. And as already been said uh, by um, Mathilde, it's, uh, the science and technology piece is really driving the change. So we've sequenced the first human genome. That cost three billion US dollars and took 10 years. And now a lot of people can do it, can sequence genomes for about $1,000 in a day or two, if that. And that technology is not stabilized. That technology will continue to get faster and cheaper in the years to come. So, and that's just one technology amongst many that we're going to talk about. So this just gives you a sense of you know, one particular technology that in 10 years has um, gotten a million times faster and cheaper uh, to do something that we couldn't have dreamt about 20 years ago. Um, the public health challenges are uh, increasing and we all know what, what these are, whether we're talking about Alzheimer's disease or type 2 diabetes or antimicrobial resistance or cancer, where these things are weighing on our uh, health systems. Uh, and the demand on health provision is, is increasing in an, in an economic environment that is uh, uh, getting more and more constrained and, and as we all know, health care budgets are being stretched in every country in the developed world. And both industry and, and a lot of the stakeholders need to change. And they, there's a realization that everyone needs to change. Uh, and we need new platforms and new ecosystems to, uh, to do that change. And within that changing world, we need to develop specific education and training initiatives, and I know we have uh, many members of uh, Masters in Regulatory Science here today, and that's one of uh, a number of key things that we need to educate uh, and train young people on so that they uh, not only have um, uh, fulfilled uh, careers in front of them, which is of course of interest, but also uh, a real necessity in the new ecosystem of uh, drug development and uh, innovative medicines. So we all know, I'm just reminding everyone of the challenges in drug development. Uh, this is a high risk business, uh, large failure rate uh, due mostly to either unpredicted toxicity uh, or, and or lack of efficacy. It's a very inefficient process. There's much duplication, partly due to the competition amongst big uh, companies who are trying to uh, uh, build a competitive advantage over uh, each other. Uh, but there's a lot of duplication in that industry, especially at the early stages of uh, development, and, and thus a lot of waste if things don't work out. And that we need to change, because currently that all builds up into very high price of medicines that uh, nobody can afford. So we need to solve this problem. It's very expensive, very complex, long timelines. And in general, you know, there's not enough of the, of the rapidly uh, changing scientific and technology world that's being integrated in real time into the regulatory and clinical pathways that, that we need in order to have a very efficient uh, process. So, um, all I've said there is, is uh, uh, put into a picture uh, that shows you how long it takes for a drug to be developed, which would be uh, you know, 15 years or something. Um, that it is very, you start off with uh, several thousand compounds only to get one uh, approved. Uh, the, uh, the approval process, as you know, is very long. And, uh, this is a, a lot, if it's linear, it's, it's a very long process. And we need to find a way of compressing this into what I call end-to-end -end integration of things going from research to the patient, but in a, 
in a very iterative process, more efficient process, more dynamic process involving many stakeholders. Uh, and uh, of course, we need new platforms to do that. So this is Elias Sahuni, who used to be the head of the NIH for a number of years and now is uh, head of global R&D for one of the big uh, pharmaceutical companies. And he's just saying, deciphering the complexity of human disease and finding safe, cost-effective solution, cost -effective solutions that help people's lives live healthier lives requires collaboration across scientific and medical communities throughout the healthcare ecosystem. And since nobody can do these things alone, we need uh, new models. So here's a new model. Uh, well, I'm saying it's new. It's uh, been going uh, from about 2008. I think uh, the first uh, euros were uh, put out the door in 2009. Uh, the overall budget until 2024 is over 5 billion euro. So it is at a certain scale. In fact, we will be allocating all of that money well before 2024 at the current rate. Uh, and uh, so we hope that we will be able to uh, attract uh, more stakeholders um, and have uh, lots of success so that this model uh, becomes a, a more, more of a, a permanent feature, maybe not in this form, but in other forms of the, uh, of the ecosystem. And currently, it's um, a public-private partnership where the public side is the European Commission putting half of the financial resource in and the European Federation for Pharmaceutical Industry Associations, so the pharma companies who are putting in the other 2.5 billion in-kind contributions. So that means that it's actually the people in these companies who are putting their time, their brains, and a lot of uh, other things uh, together to help uh, make uh, the process more, uh, much more efficient. So we try and focus on unmet needs. Uh, the model is a non-competitive uh, collaborative research model. So de facto, the companies that are involved need to agree up front that they are willing to share data amongst themselves and with our academic partners. And this is a new thing in, in of itself. Uh, Ten years ago, uh, these guys were competing uh, in a very vigorous uh, way and secrecy was huge amongst these companies. And now there's a realization that that is not working, that, um, that we need to put more brains together to uh, get to where we need to go to. And it's more brains, more data sharing, a lot of things that need uh, need to come together in order for us to make uh, pro progress. So the IMI office runs the competitive calls for proposals that you all uh, know about. Uh, and uh, we try and encourage as much as we can open collaboration in public-private consortia in terms of data sharing and so on and so forth. Obviously, guidelines around that, um, but create to uh, have the intellectual property guidelines implemented. Some examples of the polarized uh, versions of that, where in, in some instances uh, there is no intellectual property taken in, uh, in the center ground in a consortium to where Obviously, some uh, companies are very keen to license uh, intellectual property that is created, but ownership is shared within any given consortium. So we already have an ecosystem that is new. Uh, in IMI projects, we have over 7,000 researchers working in this open innovation model. 845 academic teams, 169 SMEs, 480 FPA teams, uh, 26 patient organizations, and uh, 17 regulators are already participating in this new model of collaborative uh, R&D. In IMI1, which has now come to an end just because 
uh, there's no more money. Um, so uh, all of this money has been allocated. Projects, of course, are still ongoing and very much ongoing. I think we've only closed one uh, project has come to an end, but next year I think another six or seven come to an end, and then others will uh, will 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 uh, fall into that uh, that stage. And you can see here just a budget breakdown of. Uh, the things that we have been uh, funding in terms of infectious diseases is a big, a big piece because we funded a lot of things in antimicrobial resistance and that's one of the uh, topics that I will say a, a word or two about because it is, uh, I, in my view, one of those uh, topics that are uh, really um, perfect for a public-private partnership, and I'll try and explain the reasons, uh, the reasons why. But a lot of the IMI1 uh, projects were around enabling technologies that, would, uh, that could be shared by industry players um, and that were uh, dealing in a trans-disease way, if I can put it that way. So looking for uh, biomarkers uh, of uh, drug-induced injury of kidney and liver and other uh, organs of the body, uh, looking at uh, ways that we could uh, detect uh, toxicity in different types of model systems, both in vivo and in vitro, and talking to regulators about those models and how they could be integrated into uh, drug development. Here's another one called ETOX. Uh, which is actually an in, uh, in silico predictor of toxicology. And this is, uh, has been, even though the project isn't finished yet, has been already transferred to some of the industry players that use it to uh, look at uh, predictive toxicology in, um, in, in several uh, model systems. And here's another one on looking at liver, uh, drug-induced liver injury where uh, different either uh, cell types, uh, cell systems are, are used, or more complex multi-cell uh, cultures like mini organs are, 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 being, uh, are being used, uh, and then looking at the role of the host, the genetics of the host, whether that be through HLA uh, subtypes or other uh, status of, uh, of humans like infection by HIV and other chronic diseases and that effect, uh, how that status affects uh, uh, drug-induced uh, tissue injury. Uh, here's another one on uh, uh, BioVaxSafe on uh, vaccine monitoring, looking at biomarkers. Uh, obviously the safety hurdle for vaccines is by definition extremely high because you're uh, it's a, a medical clinical intervention usually in somebody who's perfectly healthy so um, the safety bar and usually by the way two months old so uh, the, the safety bar uh, obviously has to be extremely high for especially for pediatric vaccines and it'd be very interesting to understand a little bit more about the biomarkers of inflammation allergic response and also immunity in in those, uh, in those uh, products. So <clears throat> in terms of uh, IMI, going from IMI1 then to IMI2, IMI2 uh, obviously building on the strengths of IMI1, the, both the industry players and academia and the stakeholders uh, obviously thought that this was a good idea and that we should uh, uh, put even more money in. Uh, the budget has increased from two billion to three billion and um, but looking to expand it to, to make it more uh, more end-to-end -end integration from an idea generation to a, uh, a getting something into daily medical practice and to really focus on that uh, end social impact uh, to see can we deli actually deliver in the lifetime of in the lifetime of IMI2 some things that would be uh, real um, flagship projects in terms of demonstrating the power of the public-private uh, model. And uh, in order to do that, you know, we need to increase the number of stakeholders, increase the number of people who should be part of the platform because uh, 
you know, we probably need to bring in more ICT players in the, in the health informatics uh, and genomics uh, informatics uh, piece, for as an example, but also imaging, imaging companies, uh, uh, molecular diagnostic companies, and, uh, and others who need to be there um, at, the, at the table. So the main goals are, can we actually increase success rate in clinical trials? Can we speed up the earlier stages? Can we develop new treatments uh, that would, would normally not be, uh, not be uh, available? Uh, can we develop biomarkers to diagnose and look uh, at responses to treatments? And in general, once again, very similar to IMI1, continue to improve the drug development process by creating tools that that can be transformative and certainly enabling for the industry. So building on the success of uh, IMI1, um, we're, we're trying to understand really how to speed access uh, uh, to, uh, so that patients can have uh, uh, innovation in, in their health innovation in their lives. Uh, we've aligned uh, the strategic research agenda of IMI2 to those priorities that were determined by the WHO priorities, uh, prior, priority medicines uh, document that was produced in 2013. And I'll talk a little bit about that in, uh, just on one slide. And also the creation of associated partners and partners in research to try and attract other investors to come in and, and play in this, uh, in this game. Uh, we've also tried to simplify the funding system and have a little more flexibility in what we do. In terms of the WHO list of priorities, this is the list that uh, they put out in their document. Um, we try and align ourselves as much as we can to uh, this list. It is, of course, a list of, when you look at it, of real issues for public health. I don't think anybody can... Um, uh, could challenge any of those as not being of real importance and a real burden to our health systems currently. Uh, the issue is can we have a positive impact on the, those, uh, those drivers for uh, health spending? Can we, can we bend that curve? Because as we all know, it's not a sustainable curve. So this is the financial montage then for IMI2. Uh, the figures seem to be very accurate, 1.638 billion from the Commission and, and, uh, uh, and then FPA companies and other companies will be uh, putting in uh, that uh, matched uh, 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 resources to uh, make a 3.276 uh, billion uh, euro budget uh, over the next, uh, over the next uh, while. And as I say, we'll probably have allocated uh, all of that uh, around 3 billion uh, euro budget in, over the next uh, uh, five years or so. And so we will uh, be, uh, hopefully have enough good news about the, and success to uh, incite uh, those both from the public and private sectors to continue to uh, fund an IMI or a similar public-private partnership in this area. So the public funding goes to universities, uh, hospitals, SMEs, mid-sized companies, and patient groups, which we call the public side of the equation. And then the uh, FPA companies do not receive one euro of, uh, of, of commission money, but rather contribute in kind with their expertise so that we have a seamless transition from academia to industry for a lot of these uh, projects. So I'm just going to give you uh, a few uh, examples of the things I think, and this is once again me coming in uh, as the, the new kid on the block, as it were, uh, to um, highlight the, a typical project or topic that I feel uh, is, is really a really good one for a public-private partnership. And this is the first one. Uh, Obviously, it's a, it's a growing problem. Uh, people are getting very nervous indeed about this. We don't have any answers to it. Uh, we're at the tip of the iceberg in terms of uh, uh, trying to control 
a potentially catastrophic scenario. Uh, currently, already 20, 25,000 people lose their lives in Europe uh, in this issue with a cost of 1.5 billion. And you can uh, see uh, a lot, there's a lot of press uh, around this. It's a global issue, it's not only a European issue. Uh, and there is a free flowing of, uh, uh, of uh, super bugs, uh, multi drug resistant uh, bacteria, uh, because of both uh, the widespread use of antibiotics in uh, the animal uh, production uh, for food, and of course in the human population, as, and as you know, human populations are migrating uh, more and more. Uh, due to globalization and other issues that we're only too well aware of, uh, aware of right now. So in order to, um, <clears throat> to try and um, put this into uh, a program, uh, IMI created, and this was well before I, I joined, uh, a program called New Drugs for Bad Bugs. And this program is a, a multifaceted uh, umbrella of uh, projects. Uh, we're um, investing 700 million euro in this, uh, in this uh, topic in general, which is a huge amount of money. And the issue is that there is, currently there is no incentive for the industry to invest anything in this field. Why? Because it's very expensive, it's very difficult and even if you're successful at the end of a huge investment with a, uh, a drug that is going to work, the first thing the health authorities are going to tell you after you, uh, you get approval for use of this drug by the regulators is not to use it. Or to use it very sparingly and only in exceptional circumstances because the last thing you want is Widespread, ruse, widespread use because you're just going to get another multi-drug uh, resistant bacterium uh, 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 evolving. So we need to create new business models for this. We need to create public-private partnerships in order to develop these. And there is a global uh, uh, initiative that will be um, uh, uh, will just grow from now on, uh, but I have to say that, the, in my view, the IMI uh, initiative is by far the biggest in the world uh, and is becoming a magnet for other countries and other jurisdictions to come in and join it rather than do something on their own. So a lot of, exp lot of interest uh, for the New Drugs for Bad Drugs uh, program from the US, from Canada, from Russia, from Japan from many other parts of the world. And uh, do I have another slide? Yes, I do have a, another slide that looks at the uh, uh, different uh, programs. And this goes from, uh, I'll just give you a couple of examples here. On the left-hand side, um, a project that is very much on the research end, looking at how molecules can get into uh, bacteria that can uh, kill them. That's a big translocation problem. That's why it's called translocation. Uh, right up to um, enabling, enable, which brings in SMEs with new molecules that they can be tested in clinical trial network set up in COMBACT, the, the COMBACT uh, project, project, and looking at actual business models uh, for uh, the industry and public-private partnerships through Drive AB. <clears throat> Another uh, public health uh, issue, of course, is on the neurodegeneration side through Alzheimer's disease. I don't need to go into any of the numbers here, but we are uh, looking at this from a, a holistic view of both uh, looking at uh, neurodegeneration and other neuropsychiatric diseases because uh, when you're looking at the brain and how it works, there's a lot of crossover between some of these uh, disease states, whether you're talking about schizophrenia, um, uh, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, and so on and so forth. And a lot of our projects are actually building unique data sets that assemble uh, a lot of data into one place that uh, didn't exist before. And companies are sharing these data 
and that's of huge value in order to get things done. Just uh, one in, in one particular project called New Meds, uh, this is being actively done in the schizophrenia uh, arena, and we have data now from 23,000 patients worldwide uh, on uh, schizophrenia, and this is just changing the way we describe diseases. It's changing the taxonomy of disease from saying, oh, well, this is bipolar or this is schizophrenia. No, this is a type of schizophrenia with these molecular uh, profiles, and this is the way, uh, this is the way things are going on so, in so many uh, disease states, and it's really uh, very, very exciting. Uh, Finally, before I tell, tell you a little bit about the, the calls that are either ongoing or, uh, or, or coming up in the very near future, in fact, as you may know, we, we put out a couple of calls today, um, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Uh, the education and training piece is absolutely critical uh, for us because we need to train and educate people in the middle of this translational ecosystem that we have created, but where uh, any number of people uh, in a specific discipline will need to be cross-trained in another discipline. So the, the, the medical professionals need to know a lot more about genetics and genomics and molecular stuff than they ever learned in medical school. The regulators need to understand uh, about the new advances in science um, the patients uh, are very keen to learn about um, a lot of things. In fact, patients are becoming real experts in their own, their own conditions. Um, and uh, that scares a lot of doctors, actually, in terms of the knowledge that the patient uh, has. And, uh, but we need, to, um, uh, and we, we need to educate and train them so that their voice can be heard in, uh, in the best way possible. So each of, everybody needs to be uh, uh, trained in these, in these uh, settings and we have a, a lot of uh, things, uh, different projects, um, uh, looking at different aspects of training in, in all uh, walks of life that are uh, very important uh, for us. And this UPATI one is specifically on patients. Uh, in terms of uh, patient uh, training courses and creating educational toolboxes and so on. Very successful project, by the way. <clears throat> so there's a current call ongoing. Um, the, uh, the deadline for this one uh, is the 12th of January, and we've, uh, we're looking at quantitative system toxicology, RSV, uh, a, th a recurrent theme in all of these calls is, uh, uh, is of course, big data and how we're looking at that. We're looking at that from a, both a trans disease uh, piece and for specific uh, disease states. And uh, in this one, uh, Alzheimer's disease um, and um, uh, hematological malignancies are of particular interest in, in that call. And then, uh, these are the timelines. This is all on our website, so I'm not going to uh, go into it. And today, we launched uh, Call 7 and Call 8. And Call 7 uh, looks at uh, <coughs> drug safety assessments. Uh, again, uh, neurodegenerative uh, diseases, uh, looking at those uh, caused by misfolded uh, proteins. Um, Data again in heart failure, uh, atrial fibrillation, and acute coronary syndrome, uh, neuropathic pain, uh, dry age uh, related uh, macular degeneration, a pediatric clinical uh, proof of concept uh, platform, and uh, once again, big data, um, more of a, a coordination and support action to uh, go trans these. Uh, these, uh, these um, uh, projects. And uh, call eight is focused on Ebola, uh, and we're trying out something new, uh, which is a, a multiple submission deadline rolling uh, kind of call, and uh, those are the dates, um, and uh, we're looking at Ebola and other uh, filoviral hemorrhagic fevers, because uh, we never know 
we did a lot of work in Ebola, right, preparing for uh, action for a new emerging disease, uh, but it may not be Ebola the next time. It may be something else, it might be related to Ebola. And so we want to have a little more, uh, a broader look at this. Um, anyway, you can find all of this on our uh, website that I'll uh, give to you in a minute, but just summing up uh, in terms of the of IMI and in particular this particular innovative uh, ecosystem that we have built, uh, I believe that it's it's a magnet for for collaboration and co-investment. So we're attracting people, it's getting attention, and people are saying, you know what, this public-private partnership platform is the way to go because. Uh, nobody, no one group can do this. It has to be a public-private partnership. Now, there are a lot of uh, critics um, uh, who say, well, you know, dealing with the pharma industry and using public money for this and public money for that is dangerous and aren't you just subsidizing uh, pharmaceutical, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't believe that we can do it without this partnership. And yes, at the interface of that partnership, at the interface of any public-private uh, uh, initiative, there is friction. I can tell you there's friction because uh, every day there's something that happens. Uh, but it's productive friction. And uh, we have to uh, get across these hurdles that we have every day join in and then you can you can see some of the results already that are, are have been produced and focus on those great things achieving great things imi facilitates this end-to-end -end integration and i i think if you just look at one uh one uh theme which is on rare diseases in the in the the rare disease if you're looking at very rare diseases which are these genetic diseases um, that afflict families, sometimes they don't know what disease they have or what, what, uh, how, why it's, what, what's causing it. Uh, now with the genome sequencing, we can very quickly um, determine exactly what's going on. And so this end-to-end -end integration, in fact, the time it takes uh, for, uh, and I've spoken to families who have uh, had this done, sequencing the whole family, uh, three weeks later, and they've been through diagnostic odyssey for maybe a decade before this, three weeks after the genome sequence is done on their family, they know exactly what's going on. And even if nothing can happen or there isn't a magic treatment, the fact of knowing exactly what's going on is a huge relief to these families. So there's a kind of end-to-end -end integration of something that's very, very quick and uh, these are the impacts that I think are possible uh, with, uh, with uh, this amazing suite of technologies now that we have at our fingertips. We're also a very, we're, we consider ourselves a neutral platform where people can come to us and, uh, public and we facilitate public and private interaction. Now, we, all, we're, we're, we can do this because we have carrots, right? We have a bit of funding that we can... Uh, encourage people to come together because we have that funding and that's a huge incentive for people to uh, to come together and it's an open model that we need to attract new disciplines in whether they be as i said in the imaging side in the it side and uh, uh, in other very exciting areas and um, we need to keep that openness we need to uh, protect that to attract uh, others so uh, if you're interested in other, lots of other details, and uh, details are on, on all of the call topics that I've spoken about, all of the call topics in call seven and eight are now on our website as of today. Um, and um, uh, please uh, regroup and talk to your colleagues and apply. Um, because from what I saw today, uh, earlier on, uh, the cutting edge of research that is existing in, uh, in Portugal, there's absolutely no reason why uh, Portugal shouldn't be a prominent player in the uh, innovative medicines ecosystem in, in Europe.
so thank you very much for your attention and thank you again for inviting me. for questions if I'm able to open this but in order to get a kind of a lively even more lively discussion I think that I am being kind of uh, um, tempted to invite our colleague Rogério Gaspar to help on the <laughs> to help on the let's say moderation of the Discussion. So, Rogério, I think it would be the first time that you wouldn't be here moderating the discussion, so it would be kind of uh, something not uh, familiar for you. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is the moment for questions. It was not anticipated. This was something that I didn't know before, as Pierre knows. OK, Margarida, uh, do we have anyone for the mic? Yes, myself. No, you are being recorded and lively transmitted everywhere. So you have to go to the microphone, or else people at home will not listen to you. Thank you. People at home is going to be very excited with my, uh, my question. <laughs> I have seen in one of your slides that you had a program on stem cells, and it looked like quite a big chunk of it. What, what is it all about? Because I have no idea. <laughs> no, no, what is the program, IMI program on stem cells? Yeah, so there, there, there are several, um, and with the goal, obviously, the overall goal is uh, the area of regenerative medicine. Uh, and whether that be in spinal cord injury or other uh, therapeutic areas, uh, the project is actually across many different areas looking at generation of uh, pluripotent stem cells that we would then make available to people, to all researchers and all industry players uh, in a bank that would be uh, uh, available. So that's, it's a very much an, an enabling project. Um, and uh, a huge amount of interest in, in this area, as I say, for, for different, uh, uh, different um, therapeutic areas, um, uh, which, uh, although at early stages, I think there's huge promise for, for this. And Europe is uh, very strong in regenerative medicine in terms of the research uh, that's being done. And uh, the challenge, I think, is to do with how do we uh, take that research and translate it into use, um, irrespective of what uh, therapeutic areas we're, we're looking at. So if I could add, uh, if I could add, these are actually two, it's the STEM bank yes. and the EBIS. Yes. So the STEM bank producing the, the technology and the EBIS then banking. And as Pierre is saying, advances using already these cells like in autism mm -hmm. which has been very interesting how they were using the neurons from patients uh, to so differentiated from get, got from IPS and then trying to start understanding the, 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 the disturbances let's say the perturbations which are associated to the disease so really and for the Alzheimer they are doing the same and yep. Parkinson so yes. really they are even producing in parallel yeah. uh, I'm, I'm just adding because I am in the advisory board of that project and it's it's really outstanding it's so Beatrice knows a lot yeah. more than I do about this project uh, well this one I, <laughs> I know a little bit of it because I'm following it very passionately it's it's really one of the ones that will change a lot the way so things are doing. having been given the opportunity to control Beatrice which is a rare event I would ask people on the room uh, for questions I will take uh, three or four questions for a round and then Going back, so one there. And next one will be over there. Um, my, name, uh, my name is Miguel uh, Madura. I'm from the engineering school. So uh, I'm looking more on the point of the interesting of uh, harvesting the 
data and the real world evidence. And many of the issues that are being raised here are global scientific issues, not only European problems. <clears throat> How EMI fits on the global uh, discussion on these fields? How you push the um, uh, actors from outside Europe? Yeah. How you envision that strategy? And so the second question is over there, Beatrice, if we could have someone with the mic, because we really need a recording. And the, the next one would be where? Over there, so they will be close. Good afternoon. My name is Joana Costa. I'm from Instituto Medicina Molecular. I have two brief questions. One is a very practical the one. Mic. It's not. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it, it is, is on, but you, you have to you put it to... like this. More here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, uh, what you've referred about call eight, which is a single stage application system, uh, I was just wondering how it will then um, uh, work out with the EPFIA companies, because from what I understand, you have a first stage of the, the consortium, let's say, then afterwards the selected one will go and, and um, uh, uh, partner with with EPFIA company, so it's a very practical question. The other one is, um, in your opinion, and do you think that uh, uh, IMI could be in any way uh, some sort of a, a push in terms of the interest that comp uh, pharmaceutical companies could have in terms of development of orphan drugs, in the sense that orphan drugs are not financially interesting, let's say, in terms of uh, uh, research and, and development for companies. Do you think that uh, uh, this kind of initiative, in the sense that what you've said before, it funds, let's say publicly, a little bit, that part of the research uh, um, could be a, a push in terms of the interest for these kinds of uh, medicines? So Thank mainly you. outcomes, rare diseases, and the third last for the, this round. Thank you. I have uh, one question is about uh, if you can tell me about the rationale that you have for just selecting one proposal for each uh, call. And uh, the other one is about data sharing. Uh, you say that uh, IMI is uh, promoting data sharing, but if you are somehow measuring the knowledge that is uh, being produced by those sharing, because if you give the carrots in the beginning of the proposal saying, okay, people want to share, in the end, the sharing probably <laughs> is not the same, but if you are, have measures for that, for evaluating the knowledge there. Yeah. So, Pierre, if you yes, could I will. deal with those three. This. Yes, I will. Um, okay, so the, uh, the first one was on the global stage and uh, where I am I and how we do that. So you're right that uh, a lot of the topics could be considered uh, as absolutely global. So I mentioned one that was AMR, and um, I think for that one, there's no doubt that what uh, IMI is doing is recognizes probably the largest uh, initiative worldwide that's going on in AMR, and people are coming to us to say, can we join what you're already doing? Because, uh, and that's why I say we're a magnet in some, in some uh, uh, instances. In other areas, we might go to somebody else uh, if, with, with a project that we have that's excellent, but maybe it's not enough. Um, I mean, the, the, the things we have done for Ebola, which is a global uh, initiative uh, or a global issue, uh, and especially in terms of preparedness in general for um, emerging infections. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, the WHO are involved in, in, in some of those things. So we will go to them and make sure that we're linked in to some of those global issues. Uh, and some of the activities act actually have uh, built some infrastructure in, uh, in Africa, in some African countries around Ebola that, um, that have been touched by Ebola through that uh, initiative. So it, it's very project dependent on how we link in with global, um, uh, global uh, uh, things. 
uh, but there's a lot of it going on, and uh, most of the projects are actually quite international in, in scope. Uh, on the second uh, question, <coughs> uh, the, uh, the, the practical question on the, how's the one stage thing going to work. So in the one stage, uh, a project will come in already with, uh, with the industry partners. So the, it'll be, the competition will be amongst consortia already created, right? Um, and then your uh, orphan drug one, super question. Uh, this is one of the things that I believe are perfect for a public-private partnership because the business models are very poor. Uh, nobody's going to make a lot of money out of it. And so let's work together. Um, and the pharmaceutical industries are actually quite willing to, to do things. There is already a very, and this gets back to the international thing, there is already, and IMI are not involved in, in this uh, as yet, may change, but there's already a very, very strong uh, international uh, rare disease research consortium called IRDIRC. And it was initially set up by the European Commission and NIH, uh, but now has, I don't know, many, I can't remember how many countries are involved, but a lot of countries are involved, a lot of companies are involved, there's an awful lot of research going on. And their goal is to have 200 new treatments for orphan diseases by 2020, and they are going to reach that goal. I, they are they're already at something like 140 or something. So they are going to reach, the, it's one of the, um, in my previous uh, life, I was actually part of the executive committee of that, of that uh, so I know quite a lot about it. And it is one of the, one of the best uh, things going at the moment. So the, my question for Imi there would be, uh, do we have a value added play given that there's already all of that going on? And, um, uh, uh, I think the answer still might be yes, but we have to we have to investigate. But it's a perfect topic for a public-private partnership. Um, then uh, there was one on how do we get to in the two I guess in the two-stage process how do we get to one project? So in a two-stage process, uh, the the call the topic is put out, and only the public. Uh, sector people uh, uh, build, a, build a project that answers the call and they compete for the, the, and, and, uh, the, for the, winning, the winning bid. And only the winning bid gets a chance to build a public-private consortia with a predestined group of companies that have decided to work uh, together and collaborate and put money into, uh, into the, the public-private partnership. So that's why you only end up with one. And I know it's very, it's very tough because uh, when uh, it's highly competitive at that, at that, uh, at that front end and um, it's, it varies in terms of the, uh, obviously, the, the number of, uh, of, of, of uh, applications we get. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's tough to come in second in that case, right? Because only number one gets a chance to, uh, to build. A, well, actually, that's not quite true. But uh, in usual, 99% of the cases, uh, only one. Uh, um, uh, gets to uh, gets to play. The the one percent of the cases is when the winning consortium uh, fails to bridge with the private sector. Doesn't happen very often. In fact, it ha hardly hardly ever happens. But in that case, we can take the second one and have another another try. And your what, did you have another question? There was another question on the data sharing. Great question. Well, I know what you mean, but as it happens, I don't think we have, uh, I think it, we have a lot of success in that data sharing piece once the commitment is made. Because once the consortium is built, 
there, I'll tell you, there is huge motivation within that consortium to deliver. And we're going to monitor that delivery. So if somebody's not playing the game, we can kick them out, or the consortium can kick them out. And uh, so I, there's, a, there's, there's too much pressure for failure in that, uh, in that respect. And I don't think we have had uh, very many issues on that, on that front. And we've had, as you can see, some super success. The schizophrenia thing, the, I think that's just amazing. Unbelievable that that would happen. I think six or eight pharma companies just said, well, this, we don't know, it's a bit of a black box. We, do, we don't have a great pipeline of, of, of uh, drugs for schizophrenia. There's a huge medical need. Let's pool our resources at a pre-competitive stage. We can compete later on, but for the moment, it's just, it's just too, we don't know enough about it. I remember when the PPAR gamma story, so the, this innovative in anti-diabetic drugs, popped up, bioglitazone and whatever, yeah. and all of them, 13, 15 of them, were coming with uh, uh, the same pattern of carcinogenicity in rodents. So that was a big issue because it was like uh, the, the most of the trials were being put on hold because of that carcinogenicity, because it was suspected that it should be related to the mode of action. And at that time, big, big discussions were held between companies going together in Europe, in the US, putting EMA, FDA, everybody together. And then at the moment, they would have to start sharing their information and it was just putting their carcinogenicity studies yeah. together and start discussing. Yeah. They were failing, it was impossible. Yeah. Yeah. And we are talking about around 10 years ago, not more than that, even less because 10 years when, was when it started maybe 10 to 8 to 7 years ago, and it was not possible. Mm. Yeah, so it's clear, big, big change here in this. Well, the, the day has been long for you, Pierre, and we are going <laughs> to let you have some rest before dinner. <laughs> Just to tell, just about data sharing, this is very important because you stressed the point and there are a number of uh, stakeholders on the process and the patients are a very important part of that issue. I remember that in 2011, when we had the first meeting between UFEPS, DG Research, the European Parliament and FPIA about the dream then, which was IMEI2, and uh, remember that Richard Baxter was saying, you guys are completely crazy because in the middle of the worst financial crisis in Europe, you are asking the companies to put another billion. So they, in fact, they put more than, than another billion on the process. But I remember that the decisive person on that discussion was Mary Baker. And Mary was representing the European Federation for Patients of Neurological Diseases. She had already had a great experience lobbying for stem cell research through the European Parliament. She has been in Portugal several times. There are a number of people in the room that know her uh, in person. And uh, if you are not on the meeting, you cannot imagine that. But the, the importance of having patients' organizations in a professional way looking at these issues will make data, data sharing not an issue because, in fact, the police is there and the patients are the police. They are more efficient than lawyers, more efficient than courts, because they can solve the problems in five minutes in a meeting like that. So with that word of hope on the role of patients, for a last word from your side, on the future of IMEI, probably. <laughs> well, I, I think uh, you've, you've heard about my, my conviction for the model in terms of public-private. I just think it's the only way to go. Um, but I would just like to come back to uh, Portugal and, and you guys, and um, I think I've had a great day. So thank you very much, uh, Beatrice, for, for organizing it all. Uh, thank you uh, all for uh, inviting me and um, uh, welcoming me so uh, warmly. Uh, I love this country, I have to say. I've been to it many times on vacation and so on. So, um, uh, but, uh, and I have to lear learn a bit of the language. I feel very, very bad about that. Um, uh, but uh, just a, a big thank you and encouragement uh, to you to uh, to join up with, with people and uh, come and, uh, and play on the IMI platform. It's, uh, it's good fun.
and uh, you you should uh, the, what I've seen today is just amazing uh, the cutting edge stuff that's going on here it's uh, very impressive Pierre just before finalizing I was just thinking that maybe there is a need for a, a final word with regard to something which is a big concern that, you know in Portugal we are a bit um, <laughs> driven by fate and uh, you know, that's Fado. And uh, normally we are defeated before we start fighting. It's a kind of a way of living that we have and we have to fight very strongly just to be sure that we keep on the, in the boat. And the, the word of telling our colleagues that yes, we have the conditions to be there as well as the other colleagues is, mm. is clear. But there is a kind of... Um, concept which is installed among the scientific community which is related to the high rate of failure which looks like IMI somehow appears as being even more blamed than H2020 where I'm, I have the feeling and I would like to know what you feel about that that if we think in terms of competitors that show up in for each call the rate of success is higher for IMI, mm -hmm. isn't it? Because yes. how many consortia do we have really forming and applying? Maybe two, yeah. three, four, yeah. not more yeah. than that. No. And one normally yeah. makes it. Yeah. So the yeah. rate of success, if we think in this perspective, is really higher than the H 2020. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of a word of encouragement instead mm -hmm. of having a, like a, a word of uh, pessimism or difficulty. <laughs> <Sure. laughs> <coughs> oh yeah, no, absolutely, and um, I, I, you know, there are uh, there are other uh, countries in the world a bit like Portugal in that respect. It's the sea. Uh, it might be the sea. Uh, Ireland is completely schizophrenic on this. Uh, it, uh, in Ireland, it's either uh, defeatist because uh, the UK takes everything and they have all the best universities and all this kind of stuff, or it's let's go for it because there's no fear. So <laughs> that's the, both, that's yeah, the, yeah, both, yeah, both. Yeah, both. In, in Canada, it's a, a, a bit uh, the same way in that they have a, a neighbor who is, who's get all the, always the Nobel prizes and the big, uh, and the big things and uh, big budgets um, and the Canadian research budget would dwarf, uh, completely dwarf uh, that of the uh, of the U.S. But uh, there was another thing that I found when I was in Canada that uh, a, a lot of, although they were publishing in very good journals like you do, you do, uh, there wasn't a global recognition of that scientific excellence. And I think that's something that we need to change. Uh, in terms of what you what you do, uh, the same problem in uh, in Canada. It was difficult to get the excellent science on the map somehow, uh, and uh, to attract you know the private sector players and so on. So, anything we can do on that uh, on that front as well, I think would be would be good. And I know you have a a vibrant and growing SME community. In uh, in Portugal, uh, and somebody mentioned a company. I can't remember what it was now, but the other day, somebody mentioned a Portuguese company that was you know, an SME that was just fantastic. I, I I can't remember, can't remember what it was now. But anyway, uh, if there are ways um, that uh, uh, we can get some uh, public uh, sector people to. Uh, build good collaborations with SMEs and come into a competition for uh, on IMI, it would be terrific. Okay, now finalizing and before finalizing and uh, asking you also to thank our speaker, also to stress and to thank Per Spindler to have flown from Copenhagen to Lisbon to work with us during this wonderful day and we had a very fruitful meeting this morning about bridging EIT Health and IMEI in several issues and thank you very much Per for being here. Per has been a great help to this school and I met for a number of years and we always cherish his coming back to Lisbon, are always welcome in Lisbon. Thank you very much Per. And now thanking our speaker, thank you very much Pierre thanks. and see you next time. Yeah, thank, thank you. Very much. Thank you.